fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Now today... We've got um, someone that was just over in England, I guess, a while back, and he's written a book. He's been on the show before. He's our animal communicator, uh, Rob Gutro, and his book, Ghosts of England, on a medium's vacation. So uh, welcome, Rob. Hi, Al. Hi, Julie. How are you today? Really good, really good. I, I'm really looking forward to this interview, Rob, because as the um, the listeners have just been told, helpfully by Al, you know, we've spoken before, and um, you are just such a humble guy who says it as it is, and as a fellow medium, I know we share a lot of the same views in terms of our development and how that happens, and we put it into kind of real terms, mm-hmm. and I, I love your books for that. Oh, well, thank you so much. So it, I think... Where I would like to start with this discussion, because I don't, I don't like to think of these things as interviews, because I think that's just too formal. But I think where I'd like to really begin is just a very brief overview in terms of how you've got to where you are, just for those listeners who may not be aware of your, your works to date. Um, and one of the things that I'm, I'm keen to explore with you is how you, you always say that you are just starting out on this mediumship journey and what that means for you. So, so who is Rob and where did this all begin? Okay, sure. Um, well, uh, by trade, I'm a meteorologist, so I'm a scientist. So uh, a, lot of my, uh, a lot of my experiences are all foundational in how energy works because that's basically what, what it is. When we pass away, we become energy, and we stay here as a ghost or we cross over as a spirit. Um, I, I actually developed this ability or I was awakened uh, – to the fact that I had this ability when I was a teenager and I encountered my grandfather after he passed away. And over time, um, that uh, I kind of put it on a shelf until I was in a comfortable place in life. Um, and then I had a puppy that passed away in 2005 named Buzz, and he showed me how pets communicate from the other side in many ways. So I've, re- I've written a couple books about animals, um, so pets in the afterlife, which we discussed the last time, I think. Um, and so, uh, so pets aren't the only ones that come to me. I've had a lot of people come to me, ghosts and, who are earthbound and spirits who have crossed over. Okay, so just for, the, um, for clarity, mm-hmm. tell me the difference in the communication. Tell me why people may be um, presenting to you as a ghostly form as opposed to a spirit form. What's the difference? So uh, ghosts, uh, we all make a choice when we pass away. And when when our physical energies couple with our memories, personality, and our knowledge, um, we make a choice, conscious choice, to stay here earthbound as what I call a ghost, or we cross over and join the energies that run through the universe or heaven or Valhalla, whatever you want to call the other side. And that's what I call a spirit. So it's it's location, location, location. Do you do you believe, Rob, that because some of, some theories say that? We do make that decision, but we can make that decision in terms of depending on where, what level we go to when we pass over. So depending on our learnings in life, depending how, how many times we've been reincarnated, depending mm-hmm. on how, how great we get, in, if I want a better phrase, we can then say, actually, we're OK on this, this level. We're doing all right. Or we can go back and try again. Do, is that your, your belief system? I do believe that we, uh, we come back. Um, until we are satisfied with our level on the other side. So, cool. so like that person that cut you off in traffic today, Julie, they're going to come back. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> they're not and perfect I'll, yet. <laughs> I'll be the <big> officer. <laughs> I'll be coming back too. I'll be the police officer working in traffic. Yeah. So, um, and there's so many different theories out there. So, so 
So in terms of your own development, which I, you know, I, I am absolutely with you, that we're always learning. Um, how, how did you evidence that? How, what is it that you, you learnt or you experienced that, that absolutely helped you understand there's a choice to be made at that point? I, it's actually the messages that I get from, um, from people, um, mostly people, because most pets cross over. So yeah. um, people uh, make a conscious choice to stay earthbound or to cross over. And because I belong to a paranormal group in uh, Inspired Ghost Tracking of Maryland, we do a lot of investigations of places where homes and so forth where, where people stayed as ghosts. Um, and they tell me reasons why they've stayed, whether it be unfinished business or they think they can help the family get over their passing or there's something they want to tell the family or they don't want to leave their childhood home or many, many reasons why they decide to stay. But they really all need to cross. So what would the reason, what do you think the most common reason is of staying? What would be the ben benefit to somebody to stay? There really is no benefit. Um, I liken being an earthbound ghost as living in an isolation prison um, where you cannot communicate with your loved ones in spirit who have crossed, mm -hmm. and you can rarely speak to some of the living. The only living people that can communicate with ghosts are those who uh, are mediums. Mm -hmm. And how does um, so? We, if you're not able to communicate with those living, how does um, how do we investigate and pick up on those? Um, ghosts and how and communicate with them um, as a medium and how do other people experience for example um, poltergeist so I've learned that poltergeist activity is really energy that uh, simulates an earthbound ghost mm -hmm. um, it's emotional energy typically uh, emitted by teenagers uh, teenagers going through a change can uh, can uh, copy, if you will, the energy of a ghost and make things happen, like things fly off the shelf or um, you may feel touched by something that's not there. Um, but um, what was the other part of your question there? It was about how we how that communication happens. So if, if an earthbound ghost is not able to make mm -hmm. the communication, how do poltergeists do that? What's the difference? Um, Earthbound ghosts, if they get if they get enough energy, they can make people feel things or move things or, or even appear as a dark shadow. For instance, um, my my theory is that uh, when people see shadow figures, it's just that the ghost doesn't have enough energy to appear in full color. Yeah. Uh, um, it all depends on how much energy they can gather in order to provide a signal to the living whether it be making a noise or moving something or uh, audibly speaking so that we pick it up. Um, it, it's all about the energy and uh, that they can gather. So in, in terms of your, your own development, your understanding the, the different realms, you put things in such an easy way, Rob. So people who are listening to this show will have heard us interview people who talk about um, and use very jargonistic language that it's really mm -hmm. quite hard for anybody to understand. And I've never yet heard you do that. It's all very much about what you, you've learned and the practicalities. Since we last spoke, what's, what's been your greatest learning since we last spoke? So in the last couple of years. Well, I think the greatest lesson I've ever um, I've ever learned, Julie, is from the other side. And, and that is that we really need to teach uh, to to practice kindness to everybody. That's animals and humans, um, because that's actually what makes our spirit stronger while we're alive and stronger on the other side. So it's really just it's a simple lesson. And that's just treat each other with kindness. And um, when we when we were last talking, as you um, identified, we were talking about your book, um, um, pets in the afterlife and talking about kind of, you know, the communication style and how that differs. So mm -hmm. how do you adapt your mediumship where I'm, I guess in, if you're similar to myself, you receive information. It's, it's almost as a thought that comes in and, and you have to distinguish whether that's yours or, or a spiritual uh, message. Yes. How does it differ with an animal? Um, the only way it differs from an, with an animal is 
from the perspective of the animal. So uh, what I mean by that is that messages can come in um, the way that a dog or cat would have perceived them when they were living. Um, they can come in uh, for, uh, to me. I, I usually I can hear them, feel them, see them, even smell them. Um, I've smelled wet dog on occasion. Um, dogs or cats will share words that they were familiar with in life. They'll share an image of a person that they're standing with on the other side, and they'll have me describe them. Um, for, um, even uh, a cat would, would know somebody's name. Um, a friend of mine lost his cat this year, and he sent me an email, and he told me that. And he said, is my cat okay? And I, and I told him, I said, your cat is it is fine in spirit, but keeps telling me the name Dave, and Dave is with your cat, Bunny. And and I don't know who Dave is, it, it, but Dave seems to be someone who is a contemporary, a colleague of yours. And he wrote me back, and he said, Dave was my best friend in college who passed away. Oh. Oh, so powerful, isn't it? Because, I mean, I think you, you're, you're right. It's, it's, it's a real gift to be able to communicate already. And then when you can communicate on different levels and with lost um, pets – as well they are our family when they're here and they're on earth they're our family and so when we lose them it's a huge gap you know as it is losing a human um companion um so it's, it's comforting for people to know that those um pets are still very much able to make contact and give reassurances what's the strangest message you've ever had from a pet from a pet um <laughs> Uh, I, well, I, I wouldn't say strange, but I will tell you that, <laughs> that, like people, some of them have told me that they don't want other pets in the household to play with certain toys <laughs> that <Wow>. they've identified. <laughs> <laughs> you can blame them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's pretty cool. And so, um, yeah, that's just, that's, yeah, I can just imagine, actually. People come into my house and they look at my dog's toy box and I can't imagine um, Molly, when um, eventually um, she she passes, her ever wanting any other dog anywhere near those toys, she, it's like a toddler's um, playpen. Yes. So they, they will all go with her, I think. So, um, okay, so you've recently been in the UK. I'm absolutely yes. astounded that you you didn't even look me up, knowing that I was here, and and have gone on ghost hunts. So tell me more about this trip to the UK and what inspired you. Well, they were actually before I knew you because it was in oh, 2012 and 2013, so I have an excuse. <laughs> you, are, you are somewhat forgiven. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> so tell me about the inspiration for that, because quite often, actually, there's a few people that we've interviewed that have come over to explore the UK and, and the history here. Well, the, the, the planned vacations were actually not my idea, but I am so glad that I went on them. They were actually the idea of my husband, who is uh, somewhat of an amateur historian on the Tudors mm -hmm. so, and the Tudor period, so Henry VIII and, and uh, Queen Elizabeth and so forth. Um, wow. so, so he worked with a travel agent to put together these two trips, and we – we visited Tudor palaces, uh, Tudor homes, Tudor burial sites, and you know, I, and quite frankly, I have to tell you, I had no, I, I really don't know the history. I didn't know the history at all. That was his thing. Um, I, I, you know, I have my own hobbies and so forth, and um, so I went over there not knowing anything, and I had all of these amazing experience at, experiences and all these. Tudor locations and non-Tudor locations, from Westminster Abbey to Hampton Court Palace. Wow, and um, and both are fantastic places. And I know that I've I've walked several times around Hampton Court Palace, um, in, investigating the history and and um, those that have passed. So, so tell me about the tour. What what did you set up? What where did you go? Uh, well, gosh, the first um, we went, as I mentioned, Westminster Abbey and. Um, Hampton Court Palace, but we also went to uh, – we visited the Banqueting House, which is the last uh, remnant of Whitehall Palace. We went to um, the Tower of London, and there were many ghosts there, just like in Hampton Court. Uh, yeah. We went to Canterbury, Stratford-upon-Avon, Sudley Castle. Um, we had a ghost in our room in Thornbury Castle. Wow. Um, and, I, and I actually wound up – and in the book that I wrote um, – the Ghosts of England on a Medium's Vacation, I actually f revealed, I f 
his identity. I found out who he was and why he was there. Um, and, and then I'll had to wait until I came home to figure out who he was <laughs> and why he was there. Um, but I went to Windsor and York and whilst oh, okay. you were there then come back and research it or did you did did you know anything about the history before you went? I mean I, I'm not a history buff at all. Um so for me when I go to a historic place and come up with a name, I then have to go back home and, and, and look into that and research it and is that what happened? That's exactly what happened. I you know, I as I said I had no idea <laughs> about where we were or <laughs> what the history of the place was. <laughs> So it was, it was fascinating. How, how did that particular? So if we just take that one that one spirit in in one room, how did that? How did you know they were there? Uh, the ghost uh, in Thornbury Castle. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Thornbury Castle. Just a little bit of background. Thornbury Castle was a castle that was built by the Duke of Buckingham during Henry VIII's time, and the Duke of Buckingham was uh, known to be a, a could have been a rival to the throne of Henry VIII. So of course. Henry had him beheaded <laughs> to eliminate the competition. As he did many. As he did many. Um, and he, Henry, of course, took his palace, took the, the Thornbury Castle. And so today, Thornbury Castle is a luxury bed and breakfast, and it appears as if it is in ruins. But in fact, it was just never finished being built. So there are walls and fireplaces that, that were that look like they were in ruins, but they were never finished. Um, there are two main parts of the castle, and uh, both of them are used as uh, a bed and breakfast. So we were fortunate enough to stay in one of them. And in this particular room, um, we both sensed a man. So I have to go back for a moment and tell you that my my husband, Tom, is also – he developed his medium abilities – in Westminster Abbey when we visited in 2012. Wow. Um, and it was freaky because he would confirm everything that I got and vice versa. Um, when I'm in the presence of a ghost or a spirit, I get a headache in the back of my head. When he's in the presence of a ghost or a spirit, he would smell a smell that simulated a rotting corpse. Ew, that's not quite so good. No. <laughs> so he can have that. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, we'll leave that with him. <laughs> I'll take the headache. Um, yeah, I get cold, so I, I think I'd just rather put a jumper on than get that smell. I, I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> so we, um, we both sensed a man that was standing in our room. We didn't know who he was. When I went and took a shower, I took a shower. Um, that's usually when I, um, I get a lot of messages because I'm, I'm at, I'm at peace. I'm, I'm calm. So he told me his name was Rupert, and then he also mentioned the word Wittenham. And I didn't know what Wittenham was. Um, so um, the the other thing, before I was able to solve the mystery when I came home, um, so I was armed with those two pieces of information. But I did tell Rupert before he we went to sleep. I said, Rupert, I know you're here. I'm not going to tell you to leave. But please just don't wake us until dawn. <laughs> well, unfortunately, I didn't remember. I didn't remember that in May, dawn was at 5.15 a.m. <laughs> We're in England. <laughs> and the locked uh, iron window grate that um, was outside of our window, it was locked when we went to sleep, was suddenly opened and slammed against the, the stone wall at 5.15 as the sun was peeking over the horizon. Nice alarm clock. Yes, <laughs> I should have told him to wait till seven a.m. <laughs> should have been much more specific with an English ghost. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so when hey. I came home, I found out his identity. He um, he turned out to be a, a Prince Rupert that uh, that fought in a battle nearby. Um, and the reason he stayed uh, was because the nearby uh, battle, which was in Wittenham, <laughs> as it turns out, a little borough, I guess, um, was the site of his greatest uh, defeat, and he never got over it. So when he died, he stayed there, and uh, Thornbury Castle was actually the closest to the battlefield. Okay, and, and did you manage to find out any relevance to why the window 
grate would be slammed or, or is it just, oh, just the way your intention? That was just his way of waking us up when I said it's you just don't bother us until sunrise. So he wanted to be kind of a smart aleck. Yeah. <laughs> well, you may ask me this, but I'll do my own thing anyway. And so, so you had that experience. I, I'm intrigued by um, the experience with your partner and developing those, you know, mediumship in, in Westminster Abbey. What was what's his beliefs before, Rob? I, I can't remember when we've discussed you, you, yourselves before what his beliefs were. Well, um, he uh, he never had the ability, or he said he never had it. Um, he was always very skeptical about it. Um, but we are both on a paranormal investigative team here in um, in Maryland, and uh, when we entered Westminster Abbey. Um, we went to a, a, we went to part of the abbey where some of the people were uh, some of the kings were buried, and he suddenly said he felt nauseous. He said he he smelled like a rotting corpse smell, and I was getting a headache. And I knew that there was somebody standing next to us. And it was I sensed that there was a monk standing near us. And um, there were so many ghosts walking around Westminster Abbey. Um, that's where it started, and from then on, every time we went somewhere throughout our vacation, we would both get a sense at the same time. Um, but one of the most startling uh, wake-up calls to his abilities happened right there in Westminster Abbey after his abilities started to develop. We were standing in front of the tomb of Anne of Cleves, who was Henry VIII's, I believe, fourth wife, mm -hmm. um, and uh, – we were about 20 feet apart. We were both standing facing the tomb. There was nobody between us. And at the same exact time, the, it, somebody pulled the hair on our heads. We were 20 feet apart. So they pulled the hair on, on the left side of my head and the right side of his, and he was, to the, he was standing to the left of me. So it was like somebody had an arm's length of 20 feet that pulled our hair at the same time. And we both turned to each other and said, oh, my gosh, somebody just pulled my hair. And he, says, he said the same thing. And I thought, oh, my gosh, that's crazy. Yeah. And so if he was quite skeptical before, but still part of a, a paranormal group, which is a good thing. It's always good to, to have um, people that are skeptical. And I think it's always good for a medium to be skeptical. Mm -hmm. uh, when, how did he manage that? How did he cope with that sudden switch on? Because it, for some of us, it takes a while. Some of it just happens overnight, and it's it's quite hard to adapt to. Well, um, the good thing is, um, from then on, he believed me every time I told him something. <laughs> <laughs> you are no longer totally do lally. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, I wasn't out of my mind anymore. He actually uh, he he and he goes he goes on to confirm. It, like a lot of the things that I that I get. It's so funny because my husband is a complete non-believer, or so he says. So I say to him, well, what are you saying then? That I'm a liar? And he, he looks at me, uh, 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 I'm not quite sure what to, what to say. Yeah, that's a bad position for him to be in, right? <laughs> it's a real squirming position, which is really quite good fun for me. So, um, and, and I absolutely, of course, I absolutely get that people don't, take to that easily and if you've been somebody who is fairly skeptical or a complete non-believer to suddenly have somebody confirming things and saying things that are confirmed by others um it must be fairly eerie to be sat there thinking well, how, do, how do they get this information how do they know this stuff um and not be able to make sense of it so for him to kind of switch on that ability stood in this absolute majestic arena that is westminster abbey and then start to kind of pick up as you went around different different venues. Where did you go to next in your your trail for um, you know the UK history of the Tudors? Um, well, we um, we went to let's see, we went to a, a pub actually, and that turned out to be haunted. And then we went to St Paul's Cathedral, which turned out to be haunted. And then we went to Sir John, John Stone's Museum, which turned out to have a ghost dog in it we can address in a bit <laughs> um, but the banqueting house was the next Tudor stop 
Okay. So we have a lot of um, old pubs in the UK that that, um, are haunted with um, various activity Mm -hmm. and um, some more famous than others. But I think probably most older pubs probably will will claim a spirit or a ghost or two. And certainly um, I've I've investigated the Anne of Cleves pub, which is um, further north than London. So tell me about the pub experience. Where was this in London? Um, This was called Lord Moon of the Mall. And it was uh, down the street from uh, 10 Downing Street mm-hmm. and before you get to Buckingham Palace, I believe. Yeah. Okay. It's, a, it's on Whitehall Street. That's where it is. Um, so uh, when, we were, when we were visiting there um, and we really had to learn the, uh, the protocol <laughs> for going to a pub, <laughs> we didn't realize that you had to order at the at – the, uh, uh, uh. Bar, yeah, and then <laughs> and seat, and then uh, go back and go get your food and and bring it to the table. <laughs> we saw a couple of American tourists that were waiting a long time, sitting down, waiting for someone to wait on them, and we thought it was kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. um, but while we were there, um, I I heard a male voice, and his. He said, my name is Andrew, and he told me that he lived there in the early 1700s, and he actually operated a business out of the same structure, but it wasn't a pub at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so when I, when he was talking to me, I started taking pictures um, at, the, uh, at the bar, and sure enough, there were a couple of orbs that appeared um, at the bar. Um, so... Uh, for listeners, an orb is the most simple form a ghost can take, and I'm not a big believer in orbs, but I have come to find out that orbs orbs mostly are uh, actual ghosts or spirits if they have colors and designs in them, and they can have faces in them. Um, I, we've taken a couple of pictures as paranormal investigators that have actually revealed faces in orbs, so... Um, but if they're white in color, they're either reflections of dust or pollen or bugs or something like that. But yeah. um, so Andrew was there, and um, and he was he was wearing an apron, and it, he he looked like a butcher to me. Um, and actually, he smelled like a butcher. It was <laughs> it wasn't the uh, it wasn't from the pub. <laughs> You, you guys have got this real rotting and flesh thing going on, haven't you? It's, it's not good. Yeah, it was an interesting kickoff to to uh, his abilities. <laughs> um, but and, the, and what did you what did you particularly notice? Was there was there a difference to that that style of ghost? Is that is the, are, are ghosts different in that kind of venue as to places that you've investigated in in the states? Uh, no. Not really, <clears throat> not really any difference. They they just appeared as they looked at at the time that they lived at the, in the mm-hmm. time in which they lived. So, this yeah. gentleman looked like he was uh, probably from the 1700s or even 1600s. Um, and did you part- find that easy, Rob, to identify? Because actually, we we tend to consider when we're when trying to make sense of somebody or something that we're seeing or hearing. We're thinking in our own culture, so um, and mm-hmm. so it takes an, an additional level for us to to be presented with somebody and try and make sense of where they're from if it's something different than our norm. So did that did that make sense quickly for you, or was it something you had to really kind of think about and research? Uh, that one that one was actually pretty fast for me mm-hmm. to make sense of that he may have been a butcher at the time, yeah. and this was kind of an open <clears throat> open area um, shop. Um, at that time, um, but others like uh, like Prince Rupert uh, didn't make sense to me. Um, there were, uh, as we went on, though, there were a couple of others that uh, that made immediate sense to me. One was the do- the ghost of a dog, and the other was um, some sickly ghosts at the banqueting house of Whitehall Palace. So let's talk about the dog. I mean, I, I remember in my very early days, I made a horrific error by seeing a dog and I'm not sure if we, we talked about this before but it was it was a scenario where somebody I was doing a recce for an investigation 
And the lady on reception kept asking me for a reading. Please just give me something. And I said, like, I'm really sorry. Just kind of checking out the venue. I'm not doing readings. Mm-hmm. And this lady, she kept asking and asking. And I was really very conscious of this dog running around. So I, I, I referenced the dog. I said, look, I, all I can talk about really is, is the, the dog is with you. I gave her all the details. And she said, all the details are absolutely right. She said, but I haven't got a dog in spirit. And uh, and I, I, again, I, I was it was so early days. And um, so I kept saying, well, I kept giving more and more factual information. And this this the more I was giving it, I was just digging my own grave because what I was actually doing is telling her a dog had passed away. And I could see the dog. And it was my friend who kind of interjected. And she looked at me and she said, Judy, I think we better go. And I said, oh, and I realized what I was doing. And I said, you know, I'm really sorry. I'm just going to have to go. Sometimes I get this stuff really wrong. <laughs> I walked away. And of course, she hadn't known that her dog had been been killed that day. Oh my gosh! But and, and it was it was such a horrific awakening and a learning for me because this dog was so vibrant and he just he, all he wanted to do is is to say, "Tell her I'm here. It's all good." So I was sharing that information without a break, without a think thought. So tell me about this um, the, the the dog that um, you saw and how you how you identified that the dog was from way back, not maybe something much more recent. Well, it was funny. As soon as we went into this particular museum, um, I sensed that there was a little uh, dark-colored dog running around. And uh, and I, I looked at Tom and I said, as soon as we walked through the door, I said, "There's a there's a dog in here, and 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 he's a ghost. He's earthbound." And of course, Tom just looked at me and he just rolled his eyes and he said, "Okay, we'll have to, <laughs> Come on, have to see about that." <laughs> So it was kind of funny because we where we were where we were were um, was at Sir John Soane's museum. He is um, for the for the listeners. He is one of the most famous British architects um, that lived uh, from 1753 to 1837. Um, so anyway, his home is now a museum. And it, it has like a wealth of, of architectural pieces and so forth because he was an architect and he, he collected those pieces and antiquities. Um, even priceless works of art uh, are in this home. So it's really worth visiting. And and I, I do remember in his basement he actually has an Egyptian sarcophagus, <laughs> which is kind of wacky. Yeah. Um, but long story short, we we walked around and this, this little dog kept following me and um, – so as we walked around, there was one – there's a portrait gallery, and in the portrait gallery hangs this huge portrait of Mrs. Soane, Mrs. John Soane. And in her lap is this little black and tan dog in this painting. Oh. And I said, that is the dog that I see. And so um, just outside the portrait gallery is this little – um, exposed to the air courtyard, and there's a little white stone in the middle of it. And I said, that's where the dog is buried. And, and Tom said, okay, we'll have to check it out. And on the uh, sure enough, that, that was the burial place of the dog. And the dog's name is Fanny, and um, that dog um, was the love of Mrs. Soane's life. And so I... In order to confirm that there, that the dog was actually running around there, you know, I, we always doubt ourselves until we get confirmation. So I went to one of the docents and I said, I have a question to ask you. And I, you're probably going to think I'm crazy, but has anybody working here seen the spirit, you know, the, the ghost or mm-hmm. the, the image of a, a little dog running around? And she says, and she leaned over and she said kind of softly, yes. Everybody that works here has seen this little dog. And I said, is this the dog? Is this Fanny? And she said, yes, we firmly believe this is Fanny. So she looked at me and she said, do you sense any human ghosts walking around? Because I told her about my abilities. And I said, no, I don't sense any human ghosts at all. And she said, well, neither has anybody who has ever worked here sensed any human ghosts, only the dog. So, um... I thought that was a great confirmation. Um, she also told me that after the Soans passed away, they sold the house, and there was a gentleman and his wife who bought the house that had two small dogs, 
two dachshunds, I think. Um, and neither of the dachshunds would enter the house. They were what? afraid. <laughs> so they had to move the dachshunds next door. I guess they <laughs> bought the second house next door. <laughs> So, so little Fanny is still running around in that house. So, if you go to visit John Soane's house, it's up near Baker Street, near the um, Sherlock Holmes Museum. As a matter of fact, around the corner from it, um, you may sense little Fanny running around. Um, oh, bless her! That's really quite sweet. Very warming. Why? Why would she stay? Do you think? Because of well, the house, though. I I think that she just really loved her house. She loved playing in that house. And that's the sense that she gave me when I was there. Oh, that's really kind. Did they? But the but the um the owners that they've they've passed over successfully into spirit. They're not they're not ghosts. Right. They both crossed over. So um, so uh, it, that's and that's interesting because it normally doesn't work that way. The the that our pets stay behind but fanny loved running around and playing in this house and fanny continues to love playing <laughs> playing in this house even long after his parents are gone oh, that's so really sweet. that's a priority i guess you know <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely why not that's what you like doing then why go i give it up that's right <laughs> and it's interesting because if if um you know, that the lady, when you asked her, she, she leant over and said it quietly. Well, yes, because, of course, um, here there's a in, 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 in the UK, there is very much a split division, a, a quite clear split, actually, about whether or not people believe in ghosts and spirits or not. And um, some people don't like the ad- the advertisements uh, uh, that where there's some uh, connection to a haunting because it puts people off from visiting, whereas other places thrive on it, and, and of course people go there specifically for that reason. Sure, yeah, I can I can absolutely see that. Um, um, so, so your your trip to London, all these historic places, um, is there anywhere in the UK that you you didn't visit, or any avenue of um, history that you didn't visit that you would like to in the future? Oh my gosh! There's so many, uh, so many other castles and, and homes mm. that we haven't been to. Um, uh, I I couldn't list them. I would actually have to ask my partner. <laughs> um, ask the expert. Yeah, he's the expert. I'm. Yeah, I, I I just go along for the ride. But I will tell you though that the fun part about being a medium. Um, on vacation is that you get twice as much out of any vacation because you talk to a lot of the people who passed <laughs> That's true. And, you, and you learn their history. Um, one of the one of the people that really floored me was um, the ghost of George Bolin, Anne Bolin's brother. Okay. I did not. I, I didn't even know who he was. I didn't know there was a George Bolin. Um, we so we went to visit Hever Castle, which it uh, turned out uh, to, turned out to be the the home of the Bolin family. Yes, yeah. Um, and, and and as we mentioned Anne of Cleves earlier, I, I understand that Henry VIII bequeathed that castle to the to Anne of Cleves mm-hmm. later on. You can correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> it's a fantastic location. It's a beautiful place. It, it is gorgeous, yes. And it's actually one of the places that when when children in our school system are, are being taught about um, Henry VIII, that's one of the um, the regular school trips. Oh, no kidding. I did not know uh, that. Yes, yeah. Uh, because of its history, because of its location. Yeah, it's lovely. That's fascinating. So And so um, when we what, – what's interesting about uh, – about my trip to Heber Castle is I, I call this – my my book, by the way, is separated into parts, and this was the last part, part 10, and I call it my most amazing paranormal experience in England because, number one, I, I didn't know who he was. Um, mm-hmm. When we walked in the door, I heard I heard him say, my name is George, and and he spoke in, in what I would call Old English. Um, um, I, I've read a lot of Shakespeare, and I had old English courses in college, so I, um, it was easier for me to understand what I call, I guess, kind of an accent. <laughs> um, but but when I walked in there, he said, "My name is George," and 
I, of course, I looked at my partner and I said, um, "Can you? Do you have any idea who George would be here in in Hever Castle?" And he said, "My gosh, of course, that would be George Boleyn." And I thought, "Oh, is that Anne Boleyn's brother?" And he said, "Yes." <laughs> you, know, you know, when you know the history of it, and somebody asks you a question, you you look at them like, "Why don't you know this?" <laughs> so that's what I felt like. Um. But uh, but George, what was amazing about this is that George Bolin's ghost followed us around Hever Castle. He acted like a tour guide. Um, he showed us where uh, Anne Bolin's room was. He told me a date, and he said, this is the date that I am most proud of my sister. Of course, I had to look it up when I got home, and I found out that that was – the, the year that his sister was given uh, her first royal title. Okay. I had no idea. <laughs> um, he made me feel, um, he as we went into, I guess it would be the dining room, there was a giant fireplace, and, and suddenly he made me feel like my elbow was on fire. And he told me that when he was a boy, he had burnt his elbow in the fireplace. He had scorched his elbow. Um so just all kinds of interesting things that I got as I walked through Hever Castle and George was guiding us. Um, such so, clear information. I'm sorry? But it's such clear information, the clarity, the date, the, the, the detail, helping you to experience and feel where there was pain or uncomfortableness. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm always um, – I'm always surprised when um, when ghosts can convey such uh, such exact information, um, so, and that happened actually in quite a few other cases when I was when I was experiencing uh, the ghosts in England, that they would give me names um, or or exact dates or something like that. We're very clear with our Queen's English over here, you know, Rob. I even, do. Even <laughs> Even in death, we still get it right. It's all, it's all good. I think it's as, as, as a medium, when you're, when you're communicating and you're really striving to support a person that sat in front of you and trying to offer them resolve and, and um, a, a bit of TLC, a little bit of reassurance, those specific details are, you know, you just, you're so hopeful that you're going to be able to have that communicated to you with such clarity. And for George to be able to do that, I, mean, I know there's this, this theory that the longer somebody has been passed, the more energy they're able to produce to, to communicate. I'm not sure I completely buy that, I'll be honest. But um, um, I've known some fantastic readings very, very quickly over somebody's past. But, but um, to have that communication that connection where he absolutely was aware of who you were what you were able to do and lead you around the castle i mean that's very powerful isn't it 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 sure is um and and i agree with you that it i don't think i i don't think that the longer a ghost is in existence the more energy they can draw i just think they can only draw the energy that's available to them at a given time yeah so so aspirational wise in terms of i mean obviously how does it how does investigating in the UK differ from from the states well gosh there's uh, there's so much more history i mean literally thousands of years of history in uh, in the UK and there's only really you know um, hundreds of years um, since this country the US has been settled um, of course we have a lot of we have a lot of native american um, ghostly activity here um, and I've run into a lot of that um, as well, um, but there were, it was more. I guess civilization was more structured in the UK for a lot a longer period of time. So there are a lot more. Um, there's a lot more information. And I mean, I've, I've investigated some fabulous places. I'm very fortunate to, to live in, in a country where there is so much history. Um, and certainly where I live now is at the foot of a, a hill where a five minute walk takes me to a, a Neolithic burial ground. Mm. Um, so you're never far away from from a history here. And there's been some um, it's a, a Margam Castle in Port Talbot in South Wales just never fails to amaze with activity. A paranormal activity it's every person that investigates there or, or walks in experiences something it's just you know whether that be 
audible or physical. I mean, it's just some fabulous places. So are, are you are you proposing a, a repeat visit? Oh, gosh, yes. I, I can't wait to come back. <laughs> Um, there's not only from the historic perspective, but also from the paranormal perspective. Um, the uh, just some of the places that I went to, um, I encountered so many ghosts in Hampton Court Palace, so many ghosts in the Tower of London that I wrote about. I even we even walked into a portal, which is a, a doorway used by by ghosts to go from one place to another within a portal of energy, and it sounded like it was vibrating. Um, that was in the Salt Tower in the Tower of London. Um, so uh, there's so much to uncover, both historically and paranormal, uh, paranormally speaking, if that's a word. <laughs> yeah, and in fact, not far from where you would have been standing as you uh, walk around the Tower of London, there is a, a tour of um, – there's two tours, actually, that overlap. So one tour is the um, Jack the Ripper tour. Mm-hmm. So um, on um, there's been some, a paranormal um, school kind of show some time ago now on television where they they taught they took uh, mediums who were training around around that area around that tour and uh, asked them to to say what it is that they were experiencing. So um, quite often they they picked up on the stabbings that happened, and interestingly that tour also overlaps with the Harry Potter tour. Oh. If, you're not, if you're not careful and you cross over tours halfway through, you've got a very different experience. But, <laughs> but that, that, that kind of history, even down to um, you know, the serial killing and things, is, is very close to the Tower of London, just walking through the streets. Y- yes, the, the amount of history is just uh, is overwhelming. Um, it, by the way, one of the, uh, one of the fun things parts of going through Hampton Court Palace that I didn't mention is that one of the docents told us a story of his own ghostly encounter and um, in the, I, I have that I have that in, in the book um, The Ghosts of England on a Medium's Vacation and there's a link to a, a YouTube video, he let me videotape him and he told it in his own words um, so that was, that was really cool to get actually somebody uh, a first hand witness of a ghost that's, that's, that's fantastic. And um, in Hampton Court, there are many passageways uh, behind the main public area mm-hmm. uh, that links rooms. And I was fortunate enough some time ago now to accompany. Um, uh, in fact, it was it was Dr. Kieran O'Keefe who um, we, we, we went and he did a lot of his paranormal uh, and parapsychology investigation there when he was um, sort of kind of learning, I suppose, and developing his skill set. And, and he knew all of the, um, the, the background passageways, and, and we went through a few to get from A to B, and it was fascinating. Did you happen to run into the screaming ghost of Catherine Howard? Is, um, what I, uh, the only female that I picked up on was along, um, the, it's almost like a galley with very, very deep set windows. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a very very long corridor and on, on the left as you walk down there's these huge windows that you can sit in um, and um, there was a female just rushing along there towards me as I walked down but nothing in terms of um, making a noise or it was just rushing as in running towards me and then almost passed me and through the um, well I, I happened to Leave. I think it was the Great Watching Chamber part of, um, of the castle where um, Henry VIII would make an entrance and people would wait for him to come in. Um, connected to that room outside of it is, um, for the listeners, is a place called it's, – it's now called the Haunted Gallery. But <laughs> um, it is a long corridor, and as soon as I, I walked through there um, – I suddenly heard a woman screaming, and and I looked up, and I was looking around, and and I didn't realize that I was hearing the screaming in my head, mm-hmm. and I saw a woman running toward me in what looked like um, a dress, you know, a dress from the period from the yeah. the fifteen hundreds, and she ran right through me, and I my whole body went cold, and that's the experience I had without the sound. So okay. I just had them running towards me and then passed, just gone, as if, you know, she hadn't, there was no diversion, but I didn't feel her go through me. It was just, she was there and then gone again. 
Oh, well, I'm glad <laughs> I'm glad you didn't hear the screaming. Um, so the the chill. I mean, my entire body felt like my body temperature dropped by like ten degrees. Wow! Um, and it was. I just stood there shocked, and I was listening to an audio tour. And right after that happened, the audio tour said. In this hallway, uh, Catherine Howard, young Catherine Howard, has been seen uh, running down the hallway um, because that was the hallway that she ran to to go beg Henry to spare her life. At the end of the hallway, she was told by one of Henry's um, people that she was going to be executed. Yeah. And as it turns out, that uh, Henry was not even in the palace at the time. I guess that makes him kind of a coward because he sent somebody to tell her that she was going to be executed and he disappeared. Um, but she ran down there. And um, there, if people go to visit, um, Catherine, it, Catherine Howard, is, it's, not, um, it's not a residual haunt. It's actually a, an intelligent haunt, meaning that it's interactive. Um, residual is just like a film strip that happens over and over, the same thing. But she's been known to touch people, and um, t- well, certainly she she ran through me. Um, so if you go, if people go in that that hallway, the haunted haunted gallery, as it's called, you may be able to uh, run into screaming Catherine Howard begging for her life. Just what you want, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was not exactly what I was looking for when I was going to the palace. <laughs> the funny thing is, is that you experience these things, but as as a medium, and you're 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 acknowledging it as because you're you're in that moment. But it's just not unusual to us. It's quite a usual, you know. It's just quite a normal thing. Oh, okay. I need to check that out. I need to find out who that was. <laughs> it's it's um it's just an, another normal inc- occurrence for us to be able to experience that. It, it is funny, Julie, how we, ha, being mediums that w- over time we just kind of accept things and then we go, oh, let me figure that out yeah. instead of being totally scared oh. by it. <laughs> yeah, um, and, and people have said I live in a very um, oh, was it five, six hundred year old um, farmhouse, old farmhouse, it used to be a hayloft. And um, people say, well, well, my husband actually said, do you, do you think this place is haunted? I said, well, does it matter? Because you don't believe. <laughs> but actually, thinking about it, you know, experiencing things, sensing, hearing, um, and sometimes just kind of walking along the corridor and bumping into a male in the corridor. And I think, uh, actually, yes, it is. But I don't even think about it in that way anymore. I just think, oh, there's somebody else in the house and that's it. It's, uh, it's just not an issue. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> well, it, it's been a pleasure Rob, as always, and uh, we, we've kind of come to the the end of the show, and we've run out of time again. And oh my gosh! I know it's just it's just gone so quickly. So let everybody know where can they get the books um, and list the books because every single one of your books is a one, and I would absolutely recommend people just to go and have a look because your style of writing is just so easy to read. So um, name your books, where you can get them from, and how they can contact you. Well, thank you, Julie. Um, the, um, the the first book was Ghosts and Spirits. The second book was Lessons Learned from Talking to the Dead. Then there's Pets in the Afterlife and Pets in the Afterlife 2. And the latest one is Ghosts of England on a Medium's Vacation. And um, it, they're all available on Amazon, Amazon UK, um, Amazon, wherever you are in the world, actually, you can get them on Amazon. Um and uh, there's, there's a lot more that we didn't get to talk about, about places outside of London, um, from Stratford-upon-Avon, Canterbury, um, York, and everywhere. York, yeah, York has got a very famous pub called the Golden Fleece, and York Castle uh, Museum and the, um, the cells underneath are just amazing. Clearly, that's for another show, and so we can, we can if, you, if you want to come back, Rob, that'd be amazing. I would, I would love to. I always enjoy talking to you. Thank you. Well, everybody, go and buy these books. Absolutely amazing read, and we just can't wait to catch up with Rob again. Thank you so much, Rob. Thank you. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. 
This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.